I am a little bit late. I just had to reinstall my viewer. Audio setup. This one should come from now. So now we should have voice on both channels. And Okay, so good evening, everyone. I'm broadcasting live. This is actually the time when I normally broadcast on the internet anyway, so... For listening in at meditation.sirimangalo.org. So today, I understand, is the Chinese New Year celebration. Has anyone been uh, taking part in the Second Life? Oh, that's been happening around, around today, is that what's going on today? <laughs> going on all day. My audio okay? Um, last time I saw that it was turning red. I don't want it too loud. Let me know if it's too loud. Red. Well, I don't celebrate Chinese New Year to put a damper on things. Honestly, I'm kind of confused by all the New Year's. It's been the one I grew up with. One we have on January 1st. Grew up with a Christian calendar. Not even really a Christian, maybe it's a Roman calendar. An arbitrary New Year. Then there's in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, they have a New Year. Well, so. Cambodian community here. Now we have a third new year that I have to think about. What's with all these new years? Be grumpy for a second. Mm. 
So we, but, but Buddhist holidays are, are kind of like that in the sense that they're just excuses. So our birthday is an excuse to do good deeds. Yearly reminders of Then there are standard Buddhist holidays that actually have more meaning than as a result are not just excuses. They're, they're excuses to remember important things, like the Day of the Buddha's Enlightenment, the day of his first discourse. The day of entering into the rains has a different significance rains, which for both monks and lay peoples in Buddhist society has some meaning. And then you have the exiting of the rains. New Year? Well, not so much. On the other hand, The idea of cycles is important. It's important that we count in some way, to be able to measure, to be able to compare. So a year is as good a measure as any. Boy, a whole year has gone by. That kind of thing. So for that reason, because it's a counting thing, it's a uh, traditionally become a time making determinations, right? New Year's resolutions. In Chinese tradition, it's a, a time for uh, remembering your ancestors, which of course doesn't really have anything to do with Buddhism. It's much more Confucianism and just general folk religion. But they even do it in Thailand. People who have Chinese background, and even the Thais, I think, burn stuff. They burn money, they burn houses, they burn food, they burn clothes. They burn just about everything. burn effigies, they burn representation. Big thing in India at the time of the Buddha as well, they used to burn stuff. Agni. Agni was the god of fire. Burning things. Burning things has always been symbolic for us as humans. No? Flame. Buddha talked about flames. You want to know the truth about the fire? Talk. The Chinese tradition is somehow that if you burn it, it gets to the person who's died because you've burnt the person who's died, I guess. So when you burn stuff, it gets to them. A Buddhist, it, it doesn't make any sense from the point of view of Buddhism because you're not burning real stuff, you're not sacrificing anything, you're not giving anything. Buddhist, Buddhism looks at things as much differently. So in that tradition, we should comment on this Chinese tradition the way Buddha would comment on the Indian tradition. So the Buddha went, after he became enlightened, he, he walked from Varanasi to Rajagaha. But before he went to Rajagaha, it's about 120 kilometers or something. Kilometers? No, it's further than that. I don't know why I had 120. Long distance. Well, it's a long way to walk. Before he went to Rajagaha, he had to find someone to give him legitimacy 
provide him with legitimacy, he would need to make his case to the ordinary people. And so at the time, there was a group of ascetics, three groups of ascetics, three brothers with their followings, living along a river, river flowing through Rajagaha. I'm not sure if I've seen it. 500 years ago, probably a different river. And um, they, they all worship fire. Apropos here. Fire worshippers. And so the Buddha said to them, all is on fire. Convincing them first with his magical powers, but eventually he led them to this Gatisa, which is, I guess, the top. I guess. Anyway, somewhere around there. And he taught them the, the Adita Parayaya Sutta. Adita means on fire. Position on fire. The exposition burning. Burn. Or, or all about burning. Starts by saying Sabang Bikave Adita. All is on fire for those. See the dangers of samsara. All is on fire. Do I mean by everything? Well, I is on fire. Feelings which come from sight seeing are on fire. And sounds, the same with sounds. Sounds are on fire. Ears on fire. Air smells are on fire. Consciousness is. Tongue is on fire. Basically, the six senses the internal base, the external base. Experience of it. Mind is on fire. And thoughts are on fire. And then mind, consciousness is on fire. Consciousness of thought. Wondering well, what, are, what does he mean by this? What are they on fire with? So this this method of this is a common method of the Buddha. He asks a question and he answers it. In Aditang, with what are they on fire? Ragagina dosa dinamo. Ragagi Agi is fire again, so rag. Dosa gina. Mohagina with the fire of delusion. They're on fire with defilements, but they're also on fire with suffering. They're all the types of suffering. Birth is suffering, old age is suffering, death is suffering. This is what they're on fire with. They're caught up in samsara. They're caught up in this perpetual cycle of satisfaction and 
obsession and pursuit of, of satisfaction, which is never... So we, this is the way the Buddha would approach fire ritual. This is really an important or a good way of thing or commenting on the rituals of Chinese New Year. It's not actually that related. One other thing that we should say about these sorts of um, sorts of things, because often our rituals rituals are considered to be good. Rituals are considered to be positive, beneficial, wholesome. So you burn stuff for your ancestors, and that's supposed to be wholesome, good. And the idea here is that somehow these things get to their benefit people who they're really designated towards. And so your ancestors, wherever they are, will benefit from you burning stuff for them. Curious. I mean, it's, this kind of thing happens all over the world. You know, you burn a sacrifice for God. These were big things. The angels wanted us to burn sacrifices ancient times. If you read the, the Torah, the holy book of the Jewish people, apparently God liked them to burn stuff. So they would burn stuff, and somehow it got to God. Or he liked the smell, maybe. I don't know. Fire was a big thing. But this idea that somehow you could somehow you could um, perform a sacrifice to benefit this person we do it in buddhism as well it's a common thing um to we do it towards the buddha a lot right like we burn candles and flower we so we burn incense light candles and and put flowers in front of the Buddha. And you know, the Buddha, I don't know that I can remember a point where the Buddha said, that's a good thing. Imagine he did, if you look closely, you could find where he said, oh yes, it was meritorious or something. Or probably more in passing. The most famous point is where he, he actually addressed this. He said, no, this isn't how you rightly uh, worship a Buddha. But we we do it anyway, and we've gone, in many instances, we've gone kind of crazy about it. People will, uh, talking about this today, funny enough, on Chinese New Year, if that's what today is, lunch with a, a Chinese monk, which isn't something I do every day, but he just happened to come this morning. We went out for lunch, and he was showing the pictures of how they offer 24 sets of food. But in Sri Lankan tradition, they offer 28 sets to 28 Buddhas. So we have this list of 28 Buddhas that's in one chant. Over time, have uh, taught Buddhism. Where it comes from, don't really know. But they 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 give these extravagant offerings, and I was telling him how uh, the word well the, the the one of the the most troubling aspects of it is that they throw out everything they give afterwards. So I was watching them put together these sets of of, of drinks, the three different big glasses of juice. 28 sets, and then at the end they throw the juice away, because they say we, we can't drink it once it's given to the Buddha, and they do this with food as well, so big, uh, 
extravagant offering of food to the Buddha. And they throw it out. I'm not convinced that this is, I mean, I've talked about it, but I don't want to go into too much detail. But my overarching point is that this isn't really how, how goodness works in Buddhism. In Buddhism, goodness is doing a good deed and dedicating it. Do whatever you like. You know, using the power of the goodness. Power in goodness, but it has to be goodness. Putting food in front of a statue. I, I get it. I get it. There's faith and there's confidence and there's... It's just, you're not really benefiting a statue by putting food in front of it. I mean, it's not goodness in the same way as giving food to a beggar is, or giving food to a monk or a religious teacher is. Right? You feed someone who is teaching good things. Sorry, I really don't. I'm not hinting at anything. <laughs> but, but this is the thing, is people would give food in the old days and, and, and even now in, in Buddhist countries. They would give food to, to religious leaders and that that's clearly good because you're you're providing life to that person. You know that you are directly supporting good things. You're directly influencing the future. To a statue, mm, you could you'd have to argue it's a different type of goodness, but it it borders on on blind ritual because there's some idea that by doing this some goodness comes of it, and that's not really how Buddhism works. Goodness comes from goodness. You know, is it actually a good thing that you're doing? Putting juice in front of a statue, putting food in front of a statue. I get that there's some goodness there. You have faith, as I said. Anyway. That's how Buddhists uh, uh, Buddhists do it, and some people will argue very fiercely that it is a good deed to do that. So, to each their own. But it, it points to this you know, this idea of ritual that we have now on Chinese New Year. Burn stuff. And so, a Buddhist, an actual Buddhist ceremony wouldn't be to burn stuff hoping that it gets to the people you love, though so you could argue that, you know, your good thoughts, the fact that you are wishing them well, yeah, there's something there for sure. It's a way of clearing your, your thoughts and thinking good thoughts about that person, respecting, revering them. It's a symbolic gesture, and that's probably how they explain it these days, otherwise it would be kind of weird. But there is a way that your goodness can reach the deceased. And that is by dedicating actual good deeds. Like if you compare burning fake money, fake gold, to actually taking money and, and doing good things with it, and then saying, you know, this is out of respect for that person. You know, I do this on behalf of that person. That's something that actually has, has fruit in many ways but most importantly it just has the power of the goodness it gives you the power to determine in your mind else or, the, or the, the direction that you let that deed take you so it doesn't just work for deceased relatives you give give charity and then you make a vow through this through this gift may I progress on the spiritual path. I mean, that kind of thing is just because goodness has a powerful quality to it. It empowers you. It gives you confidence as a good person. It takes away your guilt. It takes away your dinginess, your greed. It takes away a lot of good deeds. improves your mental capacity. So, I mean, this, I, I, this hopefully is somehow interesting to all of you. It's not entirely what I had in mind to talk about today. Um, I did want to talk about the idea of, I mean, just briefly to point out that 
with all these rituals or with all these celebrations. Shouldn't just make it about, we shouldn't, we should, shouldn't just make the new be about the year. So as I said, this is a way of counting. We count years. We say, so okay, the old year's gone and the new year's here. But what is actually new? This is the point. You're the same old person with all the same old problems. Because we're counting for a reason. So are we just counting one year of our life gone that we'll never get back? You're closer to death. Or are we just slaves to the stars or the, to the sun, worshipping the sun? Oh, we've gone around the sun one more time. Or is it just for fun? I think oftentimes it's just an excuse to celebrate. Countries that celebrate these things, for many people, it's just an excuse to get drunk. We do here on New Year's Eve, right? But no, new should mean something. If you want to have a happy new year, you yourself should embody the newness. We should do on our birthdays. It's also something we should do on New Year. Full of ourselves. And that's why we make these resolutions. But when you wish everyone a happy new year, many of you have probably heard me, some of you have probably heard me give this talk before, but there are four things that you should keep in mind that we should wish each other. These four things are what the Buddha said brings well-being. Appropriate for the new year because this is what we wish for the new year. This is what we want to find a point where we can say, I'm going These four things are wisdom, effort, self restraint or composure would be a good word. And renunciation. I've, I've actually, I, uh, for the actual New Year, before the New Year, but, um, just a few days before the New Year this year, I did a guided meditation on these four. I'd like to guide you guys through this. We'll do it quick and then we won't take too much. If you want to look up the full one, you can look up uh, New Year's meditations or something. It's a really good talk. I, I thought it went really well. Do my own horn, but some talks I think I do are kind of bland. I think it was pretty good. Much more guided meditation. So let's go through them now. The first... So close your eyes, start meditating, turn off Facebook, stop taking pictures. No. Start with wisdom. Wisdom starts by seeing what is. Close your eyes and say, what am I looking at? What am I looking for? Close your eyes, there's many ways of looking. No? Of, you can focus on But for wisdom, we're going to focus on reality. We're going to focus on the experiences, experiences themselves. We have to start by breaking reality up into 
its components. We have to rec start recognizing the things that we're experiencing. You close your eyes, you can't do that immediately. You close your eyes and it's not clear, what am I looking at? What is it? You need direction. Buddha provided this direction, and I don't think everyone knows this who practices Buddhism. He, he talked about mindfulness, and people know that, but he also talked about something called the four foundations of mindfulness, and these are important. They're, they are from the Buddha himself, so we should take them as a very tool in making sense of what we're experiencing. Four foundations of mindfulness, satipatthana, are the body, uh, this, all of our movements and all of our sensations, feelings, so pain or pleasure or calm, thoughts, so good thoughts, bad thoughts, past thoughts, we can And the Dhammas. Dhammas are a whole bunch of stuff that really encapsulates the path that we have to follow to become free from suffering. These four give us a good guide. The fourth one's sort of open ended or it's 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 We start with the body. Normally, I teach people to focus on the stomach because it's it's part of the body that you're always going to experience because it's affected by the breath. So when it rises, we say rise. When it, when Not out loud, just in your mind, say to yourself, rising. Start to recognize the body. So lots of different meditations use mantras. The mantra here we're using is just based on our experience. We have the feelings, so if you feel the pain or pleasure, you say pain. Thoughts, you would say thinking. Oh, so so so, um, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But with with wisdom, wisdom. Let's start with let's look at we look at it this way. So wisdom is just learning how to see things as they are, learning how to see what's there. So we start with the stomach, rise and calm. Just the other ones we can use to talk about the other three. So with, for effort, the second one, this is when you start to expand your awareness and become aware of everything else. With wisdom, we just understand that to be the basic idea of being things as they are. This is when we start to say, well, we need effort, which means we have to apply it to everything. It's not enough to sit and meditate on a single object because so many other things are going to get in the way. So when this, this is when you feel pain or you feel happiness. Incorporating them into your practice means effort. This is, this is how we accomplish effort, is to not get stuck on one thing, not get stuck on anything. So with effort, we look at everything inside of us. Third one, um, closure, um, means then expanding it even beyond ourselves to our experiences of the world around us. Feel the heat and the cold in the room and hear the noises in the room when you hear my speech. Your part. Meditate on them as well. Hear some hearing. Hear. Feels and feeling and feeling. 
and this guards that this is called composure because it it prevents um reaction to your experiences whether it be a level head it keeps you at peace it keeps you free from wants and needs or aversions of guarding the senses you know like a guard at the door it's not that we don't want to see or hear or even feel pleasure or pain it's that don't want to get caught up in them become controlled by them that, that we are always final one is renunciation so renunciation has to do with our reactions to things so the dumbness beyond just our our inner experience and the outer experience of hearing and seeing we have our reactions to all these things and as i said the, the idea is to be objective and not react It's important to be able to understand our reactions and understand why we react or what it's like to react. Because, you know, if you don't react, react to anything, pretty much when we do react, where our practice begins in terms of renunciation. Giving up our, our attachments, giving up our versions, giving up our. So we incorporate these things into our practice as well. When you like something, is your liking, like when you want. We're not trying to judge any of this. Again, the judgment is the problem in the first place. So. We're just trying to study it. Cling to our clinging. Not, not get upset about our upset. Not to get angry about our anger. Not. Focus on it. Don't be afraid of it. When you're angry as So these four things, you can see how they very much fit into uh, insight meditation practice. Good way of understanding it, and a good way of looking at the framework of the four satyatana. Quality of the practice of the four satyatana. Not long enough. But part of teaching the Dhamma and studying the Dhamma is conversation, which should just be one sided. If you have any questions or you have any comments or things, you want to tell me I really can't teach worth being. Thank you all for coming, and Happy New Year. Oh, I forgot about the ambient sound. <laughs> right, it's too loud. Um, Thank you, Pate. It also turns down. You know what I should do? Not I, what I did. I should...
Let me know if it's still too loud, but I think it should be quieter now. For me, on my viewer, I turn off all the sounds except for voice. And so I don't hear anything but your voice. So it, I, it's good on my end. <laughs> like the ambient. I thought the crickets were kind of a nice touch. It's just they're way too loud. If I keep my standard set up, they're too loud on the audio stream. So I just ruined that recording probably. Oh, I forgot about the audience audio stream. I did link it to everybody who couldn't come in today. But your audio is not very good. It's not like my audio. My audio is direct from the source. The audio you're getting is through v VVox or something. Like that. Yes. Because I, I, I uploaded, I watched that video that you made, the recording that you made, Simon, and uh, clipping as well. If it ever goes to red, if you see the thing above my head ever turn red, that's bad. Clipping, it means it's reached its limit and it just gets distorted. No red is good. Not bad, it was more the red than anything. Got a, it's got a sound gate or something. Why that is? Maybe I have to turn it up a little bit. Oh, I'm too quiet? Well, that's interesting. I don't know why that is. No, I wanted to be careful because, uh, you know, Simon was getting red bars last time. Maybe I have to turn voice up in the, in the volume. So many variables. Comments or complaints, except a lot of people saying it was good, so that's good. Oops, I think we lost your sound for a minute there. Hello? There we are. Right I just said good night. Oh. <laughs> Good night, Pante Satu.
Maybe I have to go really close to the mic or something. Thank you. Most welcome. 